Today we're going to do another quick Julia demo, and this time our focus is going to be on providing derivatives to the optimizer. Uh, so I'm going to just use this simple function here that's in our book. Um, I'm only using the simple one just so I can do the derivatives on the fly, right? I can, I can do this, but normally, of course, you'd have some separate function, use AD or whatever method makes sense, but uh, we want to provide those derivatives to the optimizer. So uh, I type those out beforehand. That's just this function and these two constraints, just to save a little time. So I'm just going to copy and paste that here in my window. Uh, we're actually going to use the same optimizer, IP opt. We're going to use uh, two different interfaces today. Um, the reason for that is now we want to provide derivatives. So I'm, I'm just going to use the interface directly. That makes it a little easier to do that. Um, before the interface we had used <clears throat> uh, did some of that for us because we weren't able to provide derivatives. So I didn't want to uh, complicate things for you too early and show you um, the derivative part when we just wanted to provide uh, the function gradient and let, and let the, the package take care of derivatives for us. In that case, it was using a forward mode AD. So we're going to use ipopt.jl, <clears throat> and this is just a wrapper to the ipopt solver that's written in C, um, C++ C. Um, <clears throat> and you can use it through jump, or the math opt interface. Jump is a very powerful package. Uh, I find it best suited for, uh, it's really nice, but I find it best suited for convex problems. For nonlinear problems, at least in my opinion, it's a bit more cumbersome to use. So I'm going to prefer it here to use just the direct wrapper. Uh, this the wrapper here so more or less follows the same structure as the underlying uh, optimizer so you can see it wants us to separate out our uh, function constraints and the derivatives of those in separate functions um, we could use the same tricks we did last time and calculate everything in one and then cache them so that'll work just fine here um, i'm just for simplicity i'm not going to do that uh, right now just because uh, it's easy to separate in this case, and, and we've already kind of discussed how to do that. So um, <clears throat> you need a function. It doesn't actually matter what I call it, but that's a fine name. So I'm just going to use eval f. Um, so here's f. I'm going to return f. OK, and that's it. So and then I'm going to have a function to evaluate my constraints. If I can spell it right. And notice that one is going to take an x, and it's going to give me the vector g. So I'm going to modify these in place. So I'm not allocating new memory each time. I'm just going to modify that constraint vector in place. So there are two constraints. I just set both those entries. I'm done with that. Next, I need something to evaluate the derivatives of f. So I'm just going to call that df. Uh, and it's going to take an x, and it wants me to populate that gradient vector. OK, so um, I have, this is a gradient, right? So I've got this is derivative of f with respect to two different variables. So there's going to be two entries here. First one is df dx1. That's going to be 2 times x1. Uh, looks like minus a half. Okay. And the next is the derivative of f with respect to x2, and that's just simply minus 1. Okay. The last one is a little more complicated. I need the Jacobian of my constraint uh, of my constraints, and you can see that it expects a little bit more. So let's talk about that. Um, just copying and pasting that over. <clears throat> So the reason why this one's a little more complicated is that often our Jacobian is going to be sparse. So in this case, our Jacobian is just two by two because I've got two constraints, two design variables. But let's say it was, you know, 100 by 50. Uh, in that case, you know, I've got, um, uh, what do I say, 100 by 50, I've got 5,000 or whatever entries. Probably most of those are not actually, or, or many of them may be zero, and I don't want to populate all of them. So here I can specify the sparsity structure. I can only set the ones that are non-zero, and that's going to be much more efficient than having the optimizer multiply a bunch of things against zeros. But in this case, it's really dense. So, oh, well, it's dense just two by two. So I have to specify all of them. So you can see it wants uh, it wants to me to do two things. In this section, it wants me to tell it what the rows and columns are that are non-zero, and then what are the values that correspond to those. So in our case, um, there's going to be four entries, right? There's a, we could say it's DG11, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2. Those are the non-zero entries, which is all of them. <clears throat> uh, but I'm going to do it. Normally, we the, the way that uh, Julia stores is like C is going to be in column order. So we'd want to go down. Uh, 
in rows for a given column. So actually do it in this order. So we'll stay in column one and go down. Uh, it will work if you do it any other way. This is just going to be a little more efficient. It's the way it's going to be stored naturally. So we're going to set the rows. We have to. There's four entries, so we're going to have four. And so rows. There's going to be four entries here. One, two, three, four. And we're basically just saying what these numbers correspond to. So this is the row. This is the column. So this is going to be one. I'm just taking this. These are the numbers here. One, two, one, two. And then I'm going to do the same thing more or less for columns. I'm saying the columns <clears throat> are one, one, two, two. Okay. So now I can set the values. There's going to be four of those. And I'm going to show you a way to make this a little bit easier. In this case, it's a bit cumbersome because it is dense. Uh, so we'll make it a little easier. But for now, we'll just do the full method just so you know also how to do this if it was sparse. So now value one. That corresponds to row one, column one, right? So this is one, one. Uh, the next one is going to be the uh, uh, two, one. By the order we've done it, one, two, two, two. So like, like we said, it's going to be efficient if we do it in the column major order, but it, but it will work any way you do it, right? You just have to be consistent. So values three means uh, that corresponds to uh, row three, column three, which in mind is is entry one, two. So that's the entry in the matrix. I'm telling it where to place that value in this Jacobian that has potentially many zeros. Okay, so uh, so in this case, this is the derivative of G1 with respect to X1. So the derivative of G1 with respect to X1, it's gonna be two times uh, X1 um, minus four. And then this is the derivative of G2 with respect to X1. So that's going to be, let's see, one times x1 uh, minus one. Next, we've got the derivative of g1 with respect to x2. That's just one. Then I've got the derivative of g2 with respect to x2. And that's going to be two times x2. Hopefully, I did those correctly. OK, so that's it. Um, I didn't really put the terms. These actually returned nothing. I, I like to make that explicit here just so we know. So actually I'll return anything, we're just modifying things in place. So that's gonna be really efficient. All right. The other things we need to provide here. Um, let's just uh, uh, look at this. So there's this thing called create problem. I'm just gonna copy and paste that. <clears throat> okay, so I need to uh, import IP opt and this create problem and I need to give it the number of variables so that's my nx lower bounds on x upper bounds on x number of constraints lower bounds on g upper bounds on g these are just these things here and then it says the number of non-zeros in the Jacobian non-zeros in the Jacobian so that's how long is this right there's four so I have four non-zeros in my Jacobian um, non-zeros in the Hessian it's not going to matter because I'm not going to use that. So actually, let me just set some of these before I go on. I just said this was four non-zeros in the Hessian. I'm not going to provide a Hessian, so it doesn't really matter what I put there. Okay, and X was two. I need some lower bounds for X. Um, let's just do like minus five. I'll just do it this way. I can do it many ways. Okay, and then the upper bound. I'm just going to say it's got to be between five and five. The constraints in this case are also two. And um, I'm going to do the format we've been doing is the one in the book here. We don't have to, right? We just said it had to be less than or equal to zero. So the lower bound is negative infinity and the upper bound is zero. But, you know, we could have moved these over the constants and done it, uh, you know, less than or equal to minus one and four. It doesn't matter. We have that level of flexibility here. So those are just a bunch of numbers I need. Next, it wants uh, the functions. Okay, these are the functions I just defined. Eval F, eval G. I called this one eval DF. So you can see you call it whatever you want because you're actually going to pass them in. And the last one, the Hessian, default is nothing if we don't provide that. And I am not going to provide it. So that's it. Um, one other note there it says here if we don't provide a callback for the Hessian, then we should add this option, right? We're going to use uh, a quasi Newton method. It's going to estimate the Hessian, it's going to use a limited method limited memory method. We talked about those briefly.
briefly where we talked about the limited memory BFGS approach. But anyway, this is just the same as those kind of quasi Newton approach, um, but for a constrained problem. So it's estimating a Hessian of the Lagrangian. Okay, so I created my problem. I actually need to call it something and whatever I call it, I better pass that same name in here. So I have the option. Uh, I think I've defined everything. So let's look at this example. I need to give it a starting point and I need to solve it. So I'll just copy and paste those. Actually, just copy and paste all of that work fine. Um, let's give it a starting point. I'm just gonna start it at uh, one, so I don't know. Okay, and then uh, we'll solve the problem here, pull out the status and I'm gonna return that status. This is gonna take that number and turn it into like a, a, some words to explain the status and then it's gonna return my optimal X and my optimal function value. So make this bigger here, let's run this. Um, oops, I'll make this a little bigger. Okay, DG is not defined. Where did I have that? Oh yeah, sorry, I was just writing these out just for uh, clarity. UL is not defined. Yes, bunch of typos here. LU is not defined. Uh, yeah, that's silly. Okay, maybe this time. All right, solved it. Great. Um, optimal solution found. Solve succeeded. That's the uh, status message here, and this is the correct solution. So that's great. That worked well. It was very efficient. We provided the derivatives. All right, so. Um, if we wanted to, um, right, like normally uh, in an engineering problem, as we talked about, we often compute many of these things at the same time, or in other words, the outputs of the constraints and the objective depend on many of the same variables. So it's hard to actually separate them. And sometimes the derivative approach to, that's usually a little bit easier to separate, but sometimes not. Sometimes we use like that implicit analytic method we talked about, and uh, it involves many of the same, uh, intermediate variables. And so sometimes we want to turn them all. You could use the exact same tricks that um, we did uh, last time. But uh, instead of doing that, I'm going to show you another approach. This is a, a new package. Actually, I just pushed it a few days ago. Um, and I made it for kind of this uh, use case here. So what it does, uh, this is called snow. the main page here, snow.jl. It's not registered right now, so you'd have to um, add it from the, the Git, uh, the Git uh, URL here. Um, but there's some docs, so we're just gonna use this. Uh, and, note, and this is, like I said, new, so you know it's still being developed here. But the idea is a few things here. I wanted to wrap a few different solvers, in this case, two, two so far, IPopt, the one I've been using, and SNopt, Another gradient-based method that uh, takes advantage of sparse derivatives, um, but it's going to make it easier. Uh, it does a few things. It makes it easier to switch between different differentiation methods. Um, so, say forward AD, reverse AD, um, different finite differencing approaches, uh, and it will do all the allocations for you. Um, these methods are all straightforward to use, but you know there are some little details if you want to be really efficient and, and do the caching. It's not too hard, but it's convenient to be able to switch between these quickly um, and also to switch between solvers quickly. It also um, will do what we just talked about, right? Take care of uh, caching these calculations for you um, so that you're not reusing function calls um, uh, between these different things. Um, and also it will uh, populate these sparsity patterns for you. So in the dense case, it's straightforward. It also will help you with sparse Jacobians, help you to detect sparsity and so on. But anyway, we're just gonna do the simple case. So we're gonna use that package. Um, let me just go to the docs. This quick start will work because it's fairly simple. So we could do the case. Um, well, why don't we do the exact same case first where we provide everything. So let's just call this uh, some simple function here. And the signature that it wants is to return, let's say we want to return everything in one function here. So we'll get rid of all these separate functions. Uh, oops. 
we go. And uh, we're going to return F. Okay, and so in this case, we're going to do it dense. So if, if it's sparse, uh, the format is, well, you can use the Julia sparse matrix, but we're going to do a dense thing here. So we're going to just treat it like a matrix a little bit easier to work with. So we're going to populate these. So this is DG11. Um, this one is 2, 1. This is 1, 2. Normally, I'd let do it in the other order. I'd do this one before this, just because that's the way I'm used to thinking of it. But it doesn't matter here, because we're explicitly putting those indexes in. OK, that's it. So there's my function. Um, notice this case here only shows constraints. There's another example later with derivatives. But we're just basically going to have many of the same kind of things here, the starting points. Um, Actually, let me just copy and paste all of this. Some of the same kind of inputs we had before from the last one, a starting point, lower bounds, upper bounds. Here we just have two constraints and we're gonna use the same format. Uh, we'll use the IPOP solver. That's actually the default, so we wouldn't have to do anything here. Um, and this will work except for one thing. In this case, we wanna provide derivatives and the default is not to provide them. So we have to go over here to the docs where it says, if you wanna specify your own derivatives, we have to add this option here. And in that case, it expects this kind of function signature. You can see that example. So let's do that. And uh, I have to give it the name that I actually called it. And there can we go. So same thing, um, that was a wrapper. But uh, the nice thing about this one though is that we can do other things. So let's say I couldn't provide derivatives uh, analytically like that. I could just provide the function and the constraints. I could uh, change this derivative method and say, I wanna do forward AD here, for example, and it will uh, do the AD for me, which is great. I could do, say I wanna do a, a, a central finite differencing or whatever. So I could switch between these things pretty easily and you can look at the docs for um, other things that can be done. I could even switch between solvers. Um, Actually, then we'll see if this is going to work. It did work. It doesn't uh, print it out here. It prints it out in a file. Um, the output is in a file. So you have to open that. There's the output of that. In fact, the IPOPT also prints out the file too. But here it is, a different one, SNOPT. This one is not a freely available one, so you'll probably use IPOPT. But anyway, that's, uh, that's it for today. So um, notice again what it does here is it will allow you to change between derivatives pretty easily, but it's also going to do that caching for you. So basically, it's taking uh, this thing where we're calculating everything together and uh, making sure that it's putting them in the right place without doing redundant function calls, populating the sparsity for me, um, and allowing me to use different differentiation methods. So, anyway, lots of options. You know, Julia is a very uh, awesome and rich ecosystem with many optimizers and derivatives that's continually growing. So it's good to have these options. See you next time.